Hare Krishna. So today we are morning continuing our discussion on understanding the unborn's understandings. The first session I talked about how can uh, an infant speak prayers when the brain is not developed. We talked about the spiritual capacity of the soul to manifest through non-physical means also. Yesterday's session I talked about how we all have a potentiality to know God. And that's how the soul can pray to God. Now, this purport is a classic. And in th here, the I'll focus on this theme of uh, what, what is the biological, psychological and spiritual difference between humans and non-humans. What is the primary difference between the two? So, Prabhupada here uses an interesting word by describing the prayers offered by the infant. He says, the human soul says. So, the soul inherently is not human. The soul is transcendental. We wouldn't say the male soul or the animal soul, female soul. The soul is a soul. But the soul in a human body or the soul who has consciousness of a human level, that is the idea of a human soul. Soul is only one. Uh, it's a <clears throat> it's a more uh, conventional way of saying things. That it's to emphasize that it's a the soul with human consciousness is speaking this. And uh, essentially, the verse. So here, the child is praying. The embryo is praying, my dear Lord. Uh, although I am in an extremely uncomfortable condition. Uh, I skipped a few verses because we want to cover this section. The three verses in between, it is said that he, the infant is in extreme pain. He says, oh my dear Lord, apart from you, who can save me? Please help me. Praise like that. And then he's offering this prayer. Although I am in a distressful situation, still I am also in a fortunate situation. The distressful situation is that in the womb there is great pain. There is great discomfort. But the fortunate thing is that I have got a human body. And what is special about the human body? That's the verse and the purport, basically. So, Dhamma Shariri. Dhamma, Shama and Dhamma. These are two words they use in the Bhagavad Gita in the 18th chapter, 42, 43, 44, 45. Krishna talks about the characteristics of the four Varanas, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. So there he says, Shama Damas Tapa Shaucham Shantirar Javam Evacham Gyanam Vigyanam Astikyam Brahma Karma Swabhavajam. So the characters of Brahmana said to me, Shama Dhamma. Now Shama refers to peacefulness of the mind. And Dhamma refers to peace, uh, control of the senses. The two are related and they are progressive. If we if our, we can keep our mind peaceful, there are no tempting or agitating thoughts that come there, that's the best. You can just progress, uh, do a pur work purposefully. That is Shama. But sometimes, either from outer perception or inner recollection, some temptations, temptations come up. And that is the time when Dhamma is required. Dhamma is, it's, it's almost like force, self-control through force. So, either the mind is unagitated or the mind is agitated, but we don't act at the sense level. We control. So, Dham Shariri, that the human body is the body where we are capable of sense control. Not that everybody will control their senses, but at least we are capable of that. Say, it's Ekadashi. If a cat sees a mouse, the cat can't think, oh, today's Ekadashi, I meant to fast today. <laughs> it sees a mouse, it pounces and eat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the animals, Prabhupada says, they are driven by their instincts. Mm -hmm. Now, animals can also plan very carefully when they have to eat their food. But, they can say, if a uh, tiger is here and a deer is here, now, if the wind is flowing this way, and the tiger knows if I go this way, the deer will smell me. So the tiger will go all the way around and then sneak into the other side and then pounce. 
so they have the intelligence to plan how best to catch their prey so it's not that entirely they lack intelligence in many ways uh the intelligence of animals can be better than humans yesterday i talked about when animals make uh, birds make nests they're very artistic uh, their sense of artistry can be can supersede that of most humans also so it's not so much uh, what they do as why they do so animals cannot have any purpose for their existence apart from eating sleeping uh, reproducing and protection even biology also says the same thing that uh, <clears throat> actually we are we are basically survival machines survival and reproduction machines and as a part of survival we need to eat as a part of survival we need to rest as a part of survival we need to avoid pain and then we want to we need to we have urge to reproduce so basically this is what this is what biology also says now uh, this idea that okay, is there something special in the human body christianity had the idea that only humans have souls and of course some thinkers among christians said that actually animals also have souls but they are a different kind of soul so that is not a soul which will evolve to a human body but it is just that this they have consciousness but they do, they have they don't have the capacity to know god so they had some idea of three different kind of souls this is this is some christian thinkers some christian thinkers they say thomas aquinas for example says that there are there are vegetative souls there are sentient souls and there are rational souls so vegetative souls are in the animal bodies sentient souls are sorry vegetative souls are in the vegetable and the plant bodies Uh, the terminology may vary because translations vary um, sentient are in the animal bodies and we humans are rational souls with our rationality we can perceive spirituality so uh, now this so this judeo christian idea put human beings above the rest of creation as a separate category and darwin in evolution came and rejected this idea they said that actually we just evolved from animals and there's nothing special about us so often the way atheists portray it is that actually <clears throat> religion makes us arrogant science makes us humble <laughs> how is that their argument is religion makes you believe that you are special but science tells us there's nothing special about you <laughs> that you are just another animal among the teeming millions in the universe so the arrogance to which humanity had been elevated by religious dogma was destroyed and humanity was restored to humility this is the achievement of darwinian evolution so say atheists now of course there is another kind of arrogance to say that there is no god and i am not accountable to anyone else so often uh, now the idea that there is no such there is nothing special about humans this is the biological idea but this gets evolutionists evolutionary scientists and evolutionary thinkers into a bind what is the bind that if we are just biological machines designed for survival and reproduction then we are not designed to search for the truth or to even know the truth see everything will function best for its purpose now this phone is meant for communicating now if i use the phone as a weapon to fight with somebody who has got a sword it's not going to work so a flashlight can show me what is maybe a few feet away but if i use a flashlight to see what is maybe 1 km away uh or like a, like if i use a flashlight to see the way what is shown by a flood light it's not going to work 
so the so the implication that if we are just animals driven by survival and reproduction instincts then we are not designed to know the truth know the truth means what that actually the every field of knowledge advances based on the understanding that things are not as they appear to be that what we see is not the at least not the complete reality it may be part of the reality but not the complete reality science advances by the by postulating invisible principles to explain visible phenomena when newton saw the fruit falling the apple falling some people say it fell in front of him some people say it fell on him whichever way but he saw a visible phenomena and he proposed an invisible principle to explain it that is the principle of gravity so the point is any field of knowledge when we go deep into it it's we move from visible phenomena to invisible principles say somebody writes very well the sentence reads very smoothly that sentence doesn't read that smoothly that the now we can see visibly the sentences but what is the difference oh you know this is grammatically this is how it can be written now a grammatical rule at this how sentences are to be written we can verbalize it but it's a construct it's a concept in our mind so basically in any field of knowledge if we have to advance we need to go beyond the visible to the invisible and if we human beings are designed only for survival and reproduction then we are not designed for knowing the truth then how can we ever know what is the truth so atheists may say that oh religion is superstition but you could even say that okay if we are not if if we can't know that religion is we can't know what is the truth then maybe religion is not the truth but atheism is also not the truth so if we are simply biological machines designed for survival and reproduction then our capacity to know anything is destroyed so darwinian evolution ultimately uh, if it is taken as absolute truth to explain everything about ourselves then it refutes itself because darwin evolution is its fundamental premise is that we are, our brains are not designed to know the truth they are designed to survive and reproduce so so truths beyond survival and reproduction we are not designed to know that so we can so some people's brains might think that there is a god some people's brains might think there is no god some people's brains might think there is a soul some people's brains might think there is no soul but we can never know so if evolution is made into a absolute ideology it becomes self contradictory it's like many other self contradictory statements if i say that i can't speak a single word of english <laughs> what happened what's wrong with that yeah i spoke seven words of english isn't it i can't speak a single word of english so it's self contradictory so basically the attempt to say that biologically there is no difference between humans and animals that we are just survival machines it is a self refuting idea and practically speaking we do see that from a functional perspective humans do hundreds of things that animals don't do and one of them we could say is humans do science humans do spirituality so basically what, what what either science or spirituality what is happening in either of these see whenever we go beyond visibles to invisibles what's happening is that when newton saw the fruit falling if he had been governed only by his instincts could he have picked up the apple eaten it and gone his way but he didn't he regulated that instinct okay what made this apple fall so any kind of knowledge requires certain amount of delay of gratification if something is cooked very nicely now i can just eat it and enjoy it but if i want to know how it is cooked so that i can cook it again then i have to wait 
have to learn about it. Okay, this is done like this. This is done like this. this, is done like this. Some small children, when their mother is cooking something which they like, they are constantly liking the mother. Is it done? Is it done? Is it done? So what is happening over there? If there is no capacity to delay gratification, then there is no growth in knowledge. Mm -hmm. So if we are sitting for Bhagavatam class and we are thinking of Prasad, 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 then we can't absorb ourselves in Bhagavatam class. Isn't it? In any area, knowledge requires the capacity to delay gratification. And this is based on a very distinctive ins insight which we humans have, which other species don't have. And what is that insight? It might be conscious, it might be subconscious. That we can trade the present for the future. I'll repeat this. That we can trade the present for the future. That means I can get some gratification in the present, but if I sacrifice that, I can get something bigger in the future. And this is what is required for everyone. If somebody wants to become an athlete, then it's not just the spectators might see them performing spectacularly in the athletic field, but before that they have done such workouts, such rigorous disciplining. So when they were doing the disciplining, what were they doing? They were sacrificing the present for the future. So this, animals, okay, this looks good, let me do it. Does it look good? Let me give it up. That's all that they are governed by. But we human beings can sacrifice the present for the future. And now, of course, how, how long term a future we think about, that can vary from person to person. There's a well-known marshmallow test, which was done by on small kids. And their kids were told that, you, know, you can have a marshmallow right now or you wait for 20 minutes and you'll get two marshmallows. So those who immediately took it, it's quite a funny video if you just search for marshmallow test on YouTube. Quite a uh, joy. So most of the kids just, even before the tester goes out of the room, they pounce on the marshmallow and eat it. But some of them, they say, I'm going to wait for 20 minutes. But they have to sit in the room. They have to look at the marshmallow. And then they look at it and they try to go to sleep. And then they touch their finger and they take it back. And then they pick it up and they look at it and they put it down. <laughs> and they try to close their eyes. <laughs> they do all kinds of things to somehow hold it back for 20, 20 minutes. Till the researcher comes back. It's, the way these kids do it is funny. But the result eventually of the study was not funny. They found that if you call these two groups of students as indulgers and resistors, in general, they found the resistors were doing better 15 years down their life in every walk of their life. They were better at their studies. They were better at their relationships. They were better in work, working in a team together as well as working individually. Because every field, if you have to succeed, it requires the ability to delay gratification. So, now somebody might think, I will delay gratification right now for 20 minutes so that instead of one, I will get two marshmallows. That's 20 minute delay. That's, I'm trading the present for the future. Some people, now we have education. Almost all over the world, people spend 10, 15 years of their, their prime time of their life when they are the, having the most energy, most sharpness, just studying. Of course, how many students study in a campus is questionable. They do all sorts of other things also. But the point is that this is an arrangement so that there can be a brighter future. If somebody has studied well, then maybe they can get a better job, they have a better career. Uh, whether it always works out that way is again open to question. But the idea is that you sacrifice the present for the future. That future could be 20, 30 years. When somebody is earning money, at that time, they could just enjoy or they could save the money. And they prepare for their retirement. And they are thinking of further. So, if we consider any responsible human being. See, responsible human being, the essence of responsibility is the capacity to trade the present for the future. 
If I'm responsible, that means I am responsible. I'm able to choose my response. So although I feel like indulging right now, but I'm able to choose the response of resisting. And that's how I can get a, get a brighter future for myself. Now what the future is, that our spiritual knowledge extends our conception of. Spiritual knowledge tells us the bright future is not just something which is a few months or a few years or a few decades down the line. A bright future is what is for eternity. And for attaining that bright future, we need to extend ourselves. Not just in terms of rigorous material disciplines for material gains, but spiritual disciplines for the ultimate spiritual gain. But that capacity to basically trade the present for the future is there within human beings. And for that capacity, the soul here is grateful. It's unfortunate that I have got this body with which I can trade the present for the future. Now, uh, ultimately, as I said that, we want to perceive, here it is said that with the, in this human body, Dishanaya, Dishanaya is with the intelligence. I can perceive you within and without the Lord. Bahir Aditi, Chachaityam, now we say Pashyatya, Pashy. The first and the last line are Pashya, Pashya, both are there, see. So other living beings see only by instinct. That means, you see what is agreeable, what is disagreeable. But with the developed human consciousness, we can perceive beyond the image, immediate to the ultimate. And we can see the Supreme Lord present within and without. Of course, this is a long journey of spiritual evolution to come to that level of perceiving the Lord. But that potential is there. And what does that potential require? It requires the willingness to delay gratification. Uh, basically, the way people think depends on their conceptions of life, what they perceive, pursue in life. The what is considered a distraction by materialists is actually the destination for spiritualists. And what is considered as a distraction by spiritualists is the destination for materialists. That which is night for all living beings is day for the self-realized. And that which is night for the self-realized is day for all living beings. That's 269 in the Bhagavad Gita. What this means is that while at one level material success and spiritual success both require the same principles. Both material success and spiritual success require the same principle of the willingness to delay gratification. If, if somebody wants to have a successful relationship, then if they want to, they need to commit themselves to one person, and that means they have to they have to say no to the gratification of relating with many other people. So even to, to be materially successful, if somebody wants to grow in their career. They need the willingness to sacrifice the present for the future. So at one level, the basic principles required for material and spiritual success are similar. At another level, the conceptions are different. The conceptions are different means that what we are seeking to achieve is radically different. It's just like now, if we want to cook food, whether a devotee is cooking food or a materialist is cooking food, the principles of cooking are the same. You know, this is how you have to mix the ingredients, this is how you have to wash the ingredients, this is how you have to heat it for this much time. Now, why we are cooking, that's very different. A materialist is cooking just for earning some money or satisfying one's palate. A devotee is cooking to please the Lord, to offer one's devotion to the Lord. So, so, similarly, in life in general, the principles for a successful life are similar in material life and spiritual life. But the purposes are very different. So, for materialistic people, what is their idea? 
okay i want to become famous i want to become successful i want to become a top scientist i want to become a top ceo but if you come down from it all ultimately it's so that one can have ahar nidra bhai mait one can have eating sleeping meeting depending done better done better and in 16 11 and 12 in the bhagavad gita krishna says that चिंताम परिमेयाम च प्रलयांताम पाशुतः कामोपभोग परमा एतावदिति निश्चितः काम उपभोग परमा द अल्टीमेट पर्पस ऑफ लाइफ इज सेंशुअल इंडल्जेंस दैट्स व्हाट मटेरियलिस्टिक पीपल बिलीव सो फॉर डिवोटीज दैट्स अ डिस्ट्रैक्शन आई डोंट वांट ऑल दिस मटेरियल इंडल्जेंस आई वांट टू फोकस ऑन कृष्ण and for spirit for materialistic people if somebody starts becoming serious about their spiritual life they will say And if you become too serious, then you will not be able to function materially. It will affect your job. It will affect your family. It's a distraction for you. So what? The, what is the distraction? What is the destination? Are two very different things for materialists and spiritualists. Now, for us as sadhakas, when we control the senses, the idea is that we delay gratification so that we can establish a connection with Krishna. and it is that connection with krishna that uplifts and ultimately liberates us so how that connection is to be established i'll talk about in tomorrow session and then we'll conclude about how circumstances affect that connection also but i'll summarize what i spoke and then we can have a few questions if you any of you have any so i spoke today i spoke on this topic of what differentiates humans from animals and i talked about how the human soul said prabhupada says so what is the soul is and christians have the idea that humans alone have souls or humans alone have a special kind of soul which can know god and atheistic scientists say that this human ego was destroyed by science which said there's nothing special about humans we are just machine which is biological machines but if that were true that we are biological machines designed only for survival and reproduction then we don't have the capacity to know deeper realities deep knowledge in any field requires going beyond appearances so science postulates invisible principles to explain visible phenomena like gravity for falling fruits and if one is not willing to delay gratification then one cannot get do it in deep knowledge in any field and if we are biological machines then uh, how do we know that what we know is right because we are not designed to know what is right we are designed only to know what will help us survive and to produce even if that is not right ultimately so uh, darwinian evolution if it is made into an absolute ideology it becomes self contradictory because it and it if it is true then it destroys our capacity to know what is true and then its own truth is questioned by that so then we see that humans do have the capacity to delve into deeper truths and i talked about the defining difference between humans and animals uh, spoken in generic terms is that humans have the insight that the present can be traded for the future and uh, this has been confirmed repeatedly even by scientists talk about the resistors and indulgers experiment with marshmallow and how their resistors were able to do much better in their lives in the long run and success in any field athletics sports education it requires the willingness to delay gratification and that is also required in spiritual life but what to delay one's gratification but and for how long that scope is redefined in spirituality so while the principles for success in material and spiritual life are similar the purposes are radically different that what is the destination for materialists is the distraction for spiritualists and what is the destination for spiritualists is a distraction for materialists so we if we keep our vision focused on the ultimate destination on krishna then as the more we are able to delay gratification the more we will be able to develop our spiritual connection with krishna and that will ultimately lead to elevation and liberation thank you very much hare krishna
Yes, Tony. Yeah, this is the last one. Specifically about that point where you were saying that um, that the premise of um, Darwinian science is that as biological machines, we only are meant to or designed to reproduce and survive. And then because that is um, stated, or therefore that automatically negates any possibility of understanding or seeking the truth. I'm just having a little under, I just find a little difficulty understanding how that argument completely hold up, and I'm sure you can flesh it out for me. Um, just one could say that, well, that's true that we want that our that our design is the first priority is, is survival and reproduction. But because we've evolved so much, you know, and we, we've gotten so much, we're no longer having to tie up our energy in survival and reproduction so much as we were in the past when we were evolving from monkeys. Uh, now we can, uh, now that energy is being redirected and man has become thoughtful, man has become introspective, and man has now looked into deeper questions about life because That's true. the energy is being rediverted. I'm just thinking how somebody would respond. Agreed. Specific individuals that I think. I agree, yeah. So, somebody might say that now because we have developed, we can, we have evolved so we can, our energy doesn't have to go all in survival and reproduction. We can think of higher things. Yeah, that's true. That's how atheists also argue. See, there's a, sometimes you dig a ditch to push your enemy into it and then you find you have fallen into the same ditch. So what happened was that I was in Australia a few, maybe a year or so ago. There was a discussion, interfaith discussion on the topic, why hasn't God died till now? Why hasn't God died till now? So what is the idea that, that now, their idea was Frederick Nietzsche, almost 150 years ago, he said that God is dead. Now when Nietzsche also said that, he, he did not speak that in the mood of celebration. But he said, what he meant was that, that the worldview that enabled people to believe in God that has been destroyed by the advancement of uh, rational scientific knowledge. And in that sense, God is dead. And he said, this is a catastrophe. He said, we are the greatest of murderers and the stain on our hands. All the oceans in the world are not enough to wash away that stain. The whole universe will collapse because of this. So... But the point was, since that time, atheists have been predicting that religion is going to die. Because their idea is that reason and faith are opposed. And faith, reason is what where science is. So as science advances, religion will recede. But religion has an incredible resilience. In America, in the Middle East, in India, religion is still there. And it's growing in many places also. So, now why is it that so many people are so religious? I mean, if you see most of history, in the past people were much more religious than they are now. But throughout history people have been religious. So the explanation that they give for this, it's a very uh, clever explanation which cleverly gets them into their own ditch, and their own ditch. They say, Actually, we humans are not designed to understand the truth. And that's why we believe the kind of untruths that are peddled by religion. <laughs> that because we human beings, are, our brains are not evolved to know the truth, that's why we believe, we tend to believe the untruths peddled by religion. And that is why so many people are still religious. Although science has given the light of truth. And there is no God, still people believe in God. So they use this argument. But the, now the problem with this argument is that if we are not designed to know the truth, and that's why we believe untruths like religion, then uh, and how do we know that irreligion is also not an untruth? Because we are not designed to know the truth. 
So if religion is the opium of the masses, then irreligion can be the heroine of the masses. <laughs> Just if relig some people believe in religion so that they can face the troubles of life with the hope that in future everything will be redeemed for me. If that's how uh, religion deadens people, that's their accusation to the realities of life. Then you can say irreligion also deadens people. Irreligion deadens people to any conception that they are accountable for their actions. So it, the, sword, the sword can cut, cut, cut both ways. So this is not an argument which we are saying. It is a logical implementation of what they themselves are saying. Now if you say yes, this is how most prominent atheists also argue that and this is a striking contradiction in any uh, aggressive atheist book. That is that at one level they say that we are simply products of our genes. In fact, um, a, prom a prominent atheist, he's written a book called The Selfish Gene. And he said that we are basically, there is no individuality to us. We are simply vehicles by which our genes reproduce and survive. So now, they say that we are, we are just products of our genes, we are controlled by our genes. And there is nothing more to us beyond our genes. And then yet, toward the end of his book, when he's talking about other things, and then he says, actually, we have the capacity to transcend our genetic impurity. And thus, we can strive to be noble. So, although we are driven by survival instinct, we can pers pers pursue higher, we can pursue higher goals. But how? If there is nothing beyond, if, if we are nothing but our genes, then we are driven by our genes. Then, how do we have... How do we uh, have the free will and the sense control to resist our genetic, genetic imperative and act differently? So they say that at one level, it's, this, this is a fundamental weakness in any atheistic argument. They say nobody is a bad person. Some people are criminals. That's because their genes have programmed them like that. So we should not call people as criminals. We should actually recognize that the, the, the genes have programmed them wrongly. But then they are so, so we are just controlled by our genes. But then they write books on atheism and they say this book, if you read objectively, then you will give up your foolish belief in God and become an enlightened atheist. Mm -hmm. But then if, if I am controlled by my genes, how can reading your book change the control of my genes on me? If some people are programmed by their genes to be believers, some people are programmed by their genes to be uh, non-believers and that's how it is. So then why try to preach atheism? So that's a fundamental contradiction. So it's not that uh, now if we argue, like taking that point, that because we have evolved we have more energy, but all our energy within the atheistic worldview is a product of our genes. I'm oversimplifying the biology over here, but essentially there is no me beyond my biology. The me, my sense of my I-ness is an illusion created. So there is no I who can actually transcend my genetic imperatives, my genetic direct directives. So in that sense, there is no, there is no way I can, I can do anything beyond what I am programmed to do. So we could, I could, as I go much more into technicalities of this. But ultimately, if you see when we, when we understand something, the whole idea of truth and false. It's not just a functional idea, okay, there's a whole year, there's not a whole year. That's functional. But truth and false is about many things which are beyond functional also. But what is truth and what is false? If, if there is none, no higher consciousness, then truth and false are simply perceptions, are simply stimulations in the brain. It's just some surging of biochemical biochemical elements in the brain leading to some kind of electricity. So, truth and falsehood, they are all nothing but electrochemical surges. Is that how we live? Is that how we function? So, it's, it's, it's a ideology that implodes into meaninglessness. It's single, it just collapses into itself. Okay. Any other question? Any other question? Yes, Martin. 
Like Nietzsche's IQ. That's the book. Yeah, I know. Mean, okay. The animals are not just going by instincts, they are they are driven, guided by the super soul. So how do we understand this? The two are not necessarily contradictory. They can be complementary. So how basically at a functional level we do that animals sometimes they exhibit phenomenal intelligence. It's like say when birds are going to migrate because the season is changing. They can go thousands of miles and then during the journey they go, they stay at another place and they may even die. And their descendants, then they come back, they take the same journey back and the descendants come and make a nest on the same tree in which their ancestor had lived. How do they know? So it, this, this animals exhibit phenomenal intelligence. Birds they were migrating. How do they how do they have a compass in their head by which they know in the vast sky where to go? It's very bewildering. So basically, instincts are also intelligence, but it is programmed intelligence. Programmed intelligence means that it is not something which they consciously think about. Like I said that we humans can trade the present for the future. So you say animals may also do that sometimes. Like when they migrate, they go through that whole difficult journey of flying. Or sometimes in cold, cold seasons, before the cold seasons come, some animals burrow under the ground and they make uh, holes for themselves where they can hibernate. But that is not something which they are consciously choosing to do. That's what they do. It's not that... They, uh, when the, the frog is say burrowing a hole in the ground for hibernation in winter, the frog is not thinking, you know, I would like to enjoy with my sheep frog, but I have to do this. No, there is no conscious choice. When they have the urge to mate, they will mate. When their biology drives them to uh, dig a hole, uh, dig a hole for future survival, they will do that. So, so they, their actions may be intelligent. But there is no intelligent, no conscious, intelligent reflection for doing those actions. So now that's one way of looking at it. So, so, so now if we are comparing humans and animals, then the difference between humans and animals is animals also have in, instinctive intelligence, we could say. Uh, and that's why they can do certain things which even the humans can't do. But they don't have that reflective intelligence to consciously reflect, consider one's options and then choose a particular course of action. That's what they don't have. So that's one framework where we're trying to differentiate between humans and animals. Now another framework of looking at this is what that nature's book, nature's IQ and similar books do is that can we find some pointers towards the existence and benevolence of God in the working of nature. So then we can say that animals have instincts and they have, that's their program intelligence. But where does it come from? Where does it come from means that if we consider biologically, now when we humans have a compass, the compass is made of magnetic material and it aligns itself in the north-south direction. And we use it. Now when the birds fly through the vast sky in a particular direction, now, their brain or their body doesn't contain any magnetic substance. So how do they get the intelligence to know which direction to fly? It's been, they found that if a bird has a nest in a particular place and you just uh, capture the bird, blind, blind it, and then take it 100 miles away, and just free it. It will fly up into the sky, go round and round and round for a few times, and then straight go back to its nest, even if it's 100 miles away. So if we are abducted 
and we are taken dropped off 100 miles away we won't know where to go unless we ask someone or we have gps something like that. so now if our human brains biologically speaking now if biologically speaking our human brains which are undeniably far more developed and sophisticated than animal brains they don't have this capacity for navigation which birds have then the question comes up is the biology alone enough to explain the navigational ability if our biology if our brain chemistry our brain structure is not enough then how can the animal's brain structure which is far sim simpler and lesser than ours be enough so then we can say that okay their instinct is not coming simply by their biology it is coming from some higher source and that's how we can understand or we can infer that it is the super soul who is guiding the wanderings of living beings so it's a different scale of frame of reference so animals do have intelligence but that is not conscious intelligence it's not reflective intelligence by which they can exercise self control it is instinctive intelligence which is what is required for their survival and their production so is it the super soul giving the instincts to every, all animals yes so right now i am speaking is the super soul ultimately is the super soul who is doing everything but in our case say i may feel angry with someone and if i want to yell then the super soul can give me the intelligence to deliver the best speech that i will ever regret mm -hmm. i can speak and the intelligence to yell and uh, yell at someone can also come from the super soul but if i want i can say no i am going to control myself i'll not get angry i'll not yell at someone and then the intelligence to control oneself and speak in a measured way that also comes from the super soul so in human in the case of human beings see everything that everyone does is ultimately without a super soul guidance nothing would happen but we human beings can choose between options now even if a say the terrorists they plan to blow up some building or some kill some innocent people to do that also requires intelligence who were planned to plotted to bring down the twin towers that required a lot of intelligence but that's destructive intelligence so even their intelligence comes from krishna but they will get karma because they are not using their free will properly so uh, all intelligence whether it is instinctive intelligence or reflective intelligence ultimately comes from the super soul but we human beings have the capacity to choose how we use that intelligence okay thank you so thank you very much grantraj shrimad bhagavatam ki shila prabhupad ki jai ram 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 ram